everyone. It's time for Food Co-ops Now. This is our series from Food Co-op Initiative about what food co-ops are and why they're more important and vital than ever right now in our society. So what are we going to be talking about today, Jacqueline? Well, Bonnie, I'm excited about this topic. It's very near and dear to my heart. We're going to talk about being rooted in community and what that means. First, I want to start with this reminder that food co-ops are community-owned grocery stores. And what that means is that hundreds, even thousands of people who just live in the community, ordinary people, purchase a share in their cooperative and they own it. Nobody else does. They have complete economic control as a community of their grocery store. And so when we say, when you take that piece and then you hear rooted in community, um, we, it's, not a, it's not a fluffy euphemism. And we want to talk about the reality of what it means to have a grocery store that's rooted in your community. So what, tell me a story about that. How does that actually play out in real life? Well, you know what, where I want to start, I want to start with why it matters based on what's actually happening on a bigger picture scale with grocery stores. So mm -hmm. a lot of folks are losing their neighborhood and community grocery stores. And this is happening all over the country. A lot of people believe that it's mostly happening in economically oppressed communities that are being left by major chains, and that is true. But it's also happening throughout, uh, throughout the US in all different kinds of communities, in college towns, in suburbs. It's pretty much happening everywhere. Are you seeing it where you are, Bonnie? We definitely are, as both in our urban communities and rural communities alike, where overnight it's announced that the grocery store that's in the center of town is being closed and people without tr access to transportation are suddenly screwed over without options for getting groceries. And then they have to drive, figure out a way to get half an hour sometimes to the closest grocery store. Exactly. And this is accelerating. Even those who are in more affluent communities with more grocery options. Fresh Time just announced in the last six months that they are that they went bankrupt and they're closing the vast majority of their stores. And we at Food Co-op Initiative, we help people start new food co-ops. We've been getting calls from all sorts of communities that used to have a Fresh Time. We're seeing the same thing with Lucky's Farmer's Market chain, with the Earth Fair chain. There are stores closing left and right. And more interestingly, it's kind of bigger than that because people think of those as mid-size natural food chains, but behind those organizations are actually bigger players. And one of those is Kroger. I don't know if you've heard much about Kroger. Do you always have Kroger on the East Coast? Not near us, but I know about it. I know it's a huge chain. Yep. It is a huge chain. It's a huge player in food. And actually, Kroger was a major investor in Lucky's Farmer's Market, and they just decided to pull out, forcing them into, uh, into foreclosure uh, and into uh, closing all of their stores. And on top of that, Kroger is actually known in the Midwest. Um, I'm from Illinois, and in Peoria, Illinois, two years ago, they closed two profitable stores. Now, this is often the story. Don't let them no, don't let them mix this around. The stories, the stores are profitable. These two profitable stores were in neighborhoods. And I think if you could guess what kind of neighborhoods, these were predominantly black neighborhoods. They closed the two Krogers and then built a mega Kroger out on the edge of town around the highway ring in a white suburb. And they know that people will have to go to those stores. Those decisions were not based on what was good for those communities. That plays out very differently at co-ops. Right, exactly. And I mean, did they, in that, in that case that you're talking about, did they even ask the community? Did they talk to the community? Did they warn the community? Did they announce, no, your grocery store is closing overnight that was in your neighborhood? And so let's kind of pivot this. So what's different about food co-ops? Food co-ops are community owned, right? And because they're rooted in community, they're not going to leave in search for higher profits. Um, you know, a number of our startup food co-ops in our region, when they do get their market studies back, your market study is going to tell you outside of town in the big lots is where you might get the most profit. But guess what? There's also food co-ops that are making the decision to stay in their downtowns so that they're meeting their community need. And, and that's just, you know, just, just to build on this point, it's a community asset. It's owned by an accountable to the community. So it's not going to be leaving your community. Um, also because you'd have to convince your membership 
to vote collectively on this, you know, and your membership is based in your community. That would be a hard thing to, to convince your community to vote against, right? And there, there's no such process with these huge chains. Exactly. I mean, like you said, Bonnie, not only do co-ops, you know, not not necessarily choose to go locate wherever is the most probably we need to be financially successful businesses let's be clear food co-ops are businesses owned by communities and they have to be financially successful and they are but they don't have to line anybody else's pockets or make any profits for anyone and so they can make these choices to be in their downtowns to be in neighborhoods that need grocery store access they can stay where the people who own it are but even better than that they often invest in making sure that other neighborhoods that we're about to lose their grocery stores don't. I was wondering if you could share with us about Hanover Food Co-op. Sure, so Hanover Co-op in, um, in our area is one of the oldest co-ops in the region, over 80 years old, and they had three stores and they found out about a neighboring community, White River Junction, about 10 years ago that the PNC chain was gonna be closing. And the, a number of community members approached them including another food co-op located in White River Junction saying that this store offered unique offerings that and was going to be letting go of a ton of staff. So Hanover organized to rally and they were able to open and preserve the store, rehire all the people or retain their jobs of the of the folks that were working at the PNC and they kept healthy food in that part of White River Junction, Vermont, which really needed it. So that's an organization that they just mobilized around a community need really quickly to retain jobs, keep them in the community, and keep healthy food access in the community. And last I heard, it's their most successful store. It's their, their sales keep growing, yeah. And this is not an uncommon story. Um, we've already talked before, if you watched the series about Willie Street Food Co-op in Madison, Wisconsin, but they've done the same. They were asked by a neighborhood that was deserted by their grocery store, predominantly black, if they could bring a Willie Street Food Co-op store there. They had two stores already, and they decided to open that store. Not only did they open it, they worked with the neighborhood about what they wanted the product mix to be, what they wanted it to, how they wanted to represent them on hiring policies from the neighborhood. This is the kind of thing we do. Co-ops go in into communities rather than leave them. And that leads me to a story I do want to feature today that's timely. Um, I have to feature one of my favorite clubs. Ugh, how do we say that? I keep saying that every COVID talk about it. <laughs> <It's hard. laughs> this one is near and dear to my heart. Oriana Food Co-op, uh, Natural Foods, up in Traverse City, Michigan. They, four years ago, they have a beautiful store uh, at the heart of their city on their bike trail. Um, I think it provides 95 jobs. It's a huge employer in the community and rooted in community, gives money back to the community, supports local foods and farmers, you name it. It's a hub of community and it makes that economy spin and it makes it a special community. They wanted to build a second store. There was a lot of demand for them to have a second grocery store on the other side of town, outside of their downtown, but in a neighborhood area. And they were very serious about it in 2016. And then a little chain decided to come in called Lucky's Farmer's Market and right in that neighborhood. And so it wasn't the right time. The co-op, again, the co-op's not out just for profit. They're not gonna take risk with this community resource that is so precious to so many. So they backed away from that decision, doubled down on their existing store, but they were busting at the seams. They needed to go somewhere. So fast forward, we're in the middle of COVID-19, this economic crisis in communities. And chains that we're planning to build are starting to pull out. We saw this in 2008. Um, and it's happening again. And Lucky's lost their investment from Kroger's and are suddenly closing. Let me take a look here in my notes. How many stores? They're closing 39 stores in 10 states out of the blue. And this, uh, this Lucky is in Traverse City, 75 jobs were going to disappear overnight in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis. So what happened? Well, the Traverse City team along got together, um, the Oriana team got together with some other independent grocers and made a bid for that store. They purchased the store and they will actually, they plan to close for a month or two, remodel it, put it together, make it look like an Oriana. But they said, you know what? Uh-uh. This is what food co-ops are here to do. These jobs need saving now. These 75 trained grocers and individuals, they deserve to keep their jobs. They're good at what they do. We're gonna make them part of the Oriana food co-op family immediately, and we're gonna stay open. And so in the middle of this crisis, they're gonna do that. But also I wanna to point to four years ago, Lucky's moved in. Four years later, they left because it wasn't profitable enough. This yep. is what we mean by rooted in community. 
Exactly. And that's, you know, just hearing, thinking about this story and how it's such a stark contrast to what you're probably experiencing in your community over the last 20 years, right? Seeing, seeing grocery stores come and close overnight or grocery stores abandon your community to go to a strip mall area where you're no longer in the downtown. We've had these conversations, we've heard these conversations all across our region in the Northeast and a number of our startups are organizing to open food co-ops in response to this great need. Um, so thank you. That story is so awesome, especially during this crisis, how a food co-op can use its unique member owned identity to respond quickly to a need that saves jobs, right? Maybe creates new jobs and keeps healthy food and business ownership anchored in community at the time when communities need it the most. And Woo, great story, right? And what an incredible feeling. But if you have a food co-op in your community, shop at it because every time you spend your grocery dollars, which you already need to spend in a food co-op, you're keeping jobs in communities, you're building local farms, you're, you're safeguarding local economies. That's what you're doing just by shopping for, gro for groceries. All right, well, this, we could go all day as you all know, but. <laughs> <laughs> This has, been, uh, this has been Jacqueline Hanna with Food Co-op Initiative, and my shout out this week is connected to this story. It's to Whitewater Grocery Co. in Whitewater, Wisconsin. They decided to form their food co-op five years ago. They're still organizing. They're trying to get a site to open their store because the only grocery store in their town left in a rural community. So they know this story firsthand. Shout out to Whitewater. <laughs> Go white water. Woo. And my, uh, this is Bonnie Husbeth with the neighboring food co-op association. And I want to give a big shout out to the Dorchester food co-op in Dorchester, Massachusetts, one of Boston's most diverse neighborhoods. They have been organizing for eight years, y'all, and they have 800, over 800 founding member owners, and they're ready to break ground. They found a site and their goal is increasing access to fresh, healthy food. But something that I want to really shout out about them is that they are committed to representing the diversity of their neighborhood and their community in their board leadership right now, in the future with their staff. So um, we're really excited for them. They're creating a gathering space for their diverse community. Shout out to Dorchester Food Co-op. Shout out to Dorchester. Thank you all for joining us. This has been Food Co-ops Now. Keep cooperating. Have a great week. Bye, everyone.